Welcome to today's Future of Work podcast. I'm Frank Cottle with the All Workspace uh, team. And today we have the pleasure of having Nat Nijen, the head of global work projects at Autonomous AI, a California-based technology company, and a global leader in integrated and collaborative software, uh, and uh, software-infused hardware, actually, uh, designed for specifically for the, uh, the hybrid workforce. Um, Nat recently graduated with dual masters uh, uh, from Harvard's Kennedy School and the MIT Sloan School of Management, where she has also worked with multiple tech startups. Nat is the uh, leading uh, co-leader of Autonomous's new employee purchase program, which is an interesting initiative that tackles how the work from home issue can be managed more effectively. Nat, welcome to the Future of Work podcast. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, employee purchase program and, and how it's addressing uh, work from home issues? Just a brief summary to get things started before we roll into some, some more detailed questions. Yes, so um, employee purchase program is basically an everything store for people to uh, equip their work from home. So um, that's basically, we also have a function where people can just buy anything, send it to their employers, and the employer just approve and pay. So it's super easy, convenient for employees with their choices they want, and employers just to streamline their uh, procurement process. Well, you know, it, as we look more closely at the hybrid work model, which is a, a big hot discussion today, how does the this program really work, and how does it make it easier for primarily employers to make their staffs efficient? Uh, how, do, how does it give the staff uh, what they need so they can work from home or work more effectively in a, in a hybrid marketplace? Yeah, um, it's a great question, Frank. Um, there are so many companies that struggle. Before, they would just like buy things in the office, but now everyone is all over the world and all over different places. And so um, in with our platform, employees can go in the portal and buy anything. So um, for example, um, some company will give a specific budget for like a thousand or two thousand dollars to their employees. They can go to the portal, pick anything like a standing desk, uh, ergonomic chairs or um, like other things that help them with work from home. And then they click on pay for me and they in, they, it will send the email to the employer. Employer would just say approve and put in the payment. So that way the employer don't have to worry about where do the employees leave and what do they want? That is on the employee's choice. The employee well, doesn't you know, it, 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 the big struggle generally is at the corporate level, trying to decide how to create budgets and how to support work from home um, because every employee has different needs. And I, I understand that you're, system has a pick and choose capability yeah. that that's obvious and in any good system would have that yes. um, and, and you make the execution pretty easy mm -hmm. but how do you guide the corporation before that so that they can set up the right structure um, and support that structure. Uh, what do you have business rules that you put in place? Um, do you have a consulting group that advises the employer on how to organize their team? And what size companies are you working with? Are it small startups or large corporations, government? What's the bandwidth of, of, of your experience here? Yeah, so uh, the companies, we have customers, like business customers from like around 100,000 business uh, customers. So like it ranged from the small startups to the Fortune 500s. And like actually our top, uh, like the top companies that purchase from us, more like the employees purchase from us uh, are from Google, Amazon, um, all these, these top tech. Um, and then going to the smaller ones with like five or 10 employees. Um, and so we see that um, in terms of, go back to your questions, um, do we provide the guidance, a specific guidance in terms of what, how they plan the budget? Um, we, so we write podcasts, not podcasts, we write uh, blog posts um, and different materials and send it out um, 
to help their employers. And po this podcast is one of the things that we discuss as well. So uh, the idea that um, like so many, um, like looking at around, like we see uh, a number of companies. So for example, Google provides, remember like a thousand dollars to employees and then Microsoft by fifteen hundred dollars. That's on the budget, and well, I would let's, say let, let, let's stick with Google uh, yeah. as an example because everybody knows Google. Uh, mm -hmm. I happen to know Google very well and am uh, fairly close friends with their head of uh, strategic planning uh, globally. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that company really well. How did how does Google set up their work from home structure to support employees with furniture that meets uh, ergonomic needs, um, uh, that uh, creates a proper work from home environment. Because we know Google sets things up to work from home, also work near home. Mm -hmm. There's a yes. big, big difference. Uh, they don't want people just stuck in their home, particularly in employees that don't have a good home environment from which to work. You might have a uh, a new engineer that uh, is uh, just moved here from somewhere and only has a small apartment or maybe it has a small apartment with a roommate. And the roommate has a dog and you know, all these things that, that are real life. And Google's trying to sort this out. How do you bridge from home to near home and then back to the corporate office? Because that's the entire hybrid model, not just the from home part. Oh yeah, totally. Um, so I, so to be uh, clear, like I don't know specifically how they're doing in terms of helping their employees work near home, but I have seen so many companies, corporations that are thinking of having satellite office or getting co-working space subscription for their employees. And so those co-working space networks already have existing system platform, everything for these companies to have an option for employees to work remotely near home instead of having to go half an hour, an hour to the office. Um, and so those that is one option. Um, and then a lot of option is going back to the idea of supporting their employees work from home, then uh, like thinking about how much would it cost in the over, over there in the market, how much would it cost to get economic chairs, a standing desk. That's a basic thing uh, for people to keep being productive, energized and ha lead healthy life. Um, and so like there's, those are the just options. But I think another thing that should definitely one of the most important thing is the culture of the company. And so the planning budget, you give them options out there. But then how do you actually stand behind it and supporting it by thinking about the incentives? So the, a lot of people actually have problem with working, like thinking about like working near home or remotely. But then the employers, like the manager may evaluate that performance differently if they are not in the office. And so that like come back into you, the key point is providing options, but also how to stand behind that option in order to support the employees with those options um, so that they can work productively. And um, like so many, uh, so like that go back, not measuring employees in terms of how many hours that they are FaceTime, but on, on the output that I have provided. Um, and then like changing the way to measure things as well. So like, it's a much more of like a reflect, a setback, not setback, a reflect, take a step back and say, what are we measuring? And are the employees happy? And especially during this time, it's a great resignation time where uh, people really started thinking, what am I doing? Uh, am I loving what I do or not? And so like, are the companies I'm working for, or like is the company is supporting my growth in many ways, um, supporting the employees, caring for the employees. So like that's, those are the questions. Like I think backbone of it, the organization culture has a support for it. Well, you know, that, that's, that's an important issue. Um, and I think as people move around uh, mm -hmm. and as we go through changes in our whole work processes that, that have been started probably in 2016 and 17, but the pandemic uh, accelerated everything or for, became a forced issue for many of us. Um, um, how are companies and what tools are companies using uh, in your view? Uh, how are they measuring that productivity with tools to get the data to really understand um, not just the productivity, but the, the mood, if you will, of the employees? Because uh, 
people have been jerked around a little bit on this. Oh, go home. No, come back. Oh, don't go. Don't come back now. Come back later. Oh, here's what we want you to do. There's been a lot of not just change, but a little bit of chaos. Yes. Uh, and how are you measuring or how are you seeing companies use your tools or other tools that you see uh, out there to measure that the level of both productivity as well as we'll call it employee positive employee engagement yeah um so in terms of uh employees uh like measuring productivities and um employees engagement i think um there are there's a number of negative like not um bad examples out there where people measured wrong um so for example like i've heard of uh, a friend working for a technology company and they would talk about how they the organization would use um like Chira is one example and like different levels of employees in the organization would view it differently so like for example the manager would say focus on how many tasks i have done how many tickets i have fired off but then for the people who are executing it like it become a painful point for them and it's just like waste of time instead um and so i think that means that like different levels of employees should be measured differently. For autonomous, we have the, like we talk about measurement in terms of um, like each each team we have different measurement. So for example, we'll talk about revenue growth uh, or um, how is the customer satisfying with our service. Um, what is uh, like uh, we net, net for example we use net promotional score so each team would have different tasks at the end of the measure back into the key objective result that the company wants rather than like how many tickets they fire off how many items but like how does that at the end help the result of that the companies want it to achieve um and so that's how we measure it but not on like specific systems that are out there and measuring some people would just I feel like there are so many companies that now become like the number of companies become more like grappling on like measuring their employees like present how many time they're online how many emails they send out how many like well you know, they that, put on class. yeah that that's really when you're measuring those sorts of metrics that's really measuring of that's a form of presentism uh presenteeism where yes. You're you're basically saying uh, what time did you show up and what yeah. time did you leave and, and et cetera and we we know from experience now that that's not an effective management yeah. tool. I okay. think from what you said that the the thing that meant the most to me at least and, uh, is that measuring customer satisfaction, uh, happy teams create and support happy customers. Totally agree. Unhappy teams literally piss the customers off. Yes. Uh, 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 so, so really employee satisfaction and the interaction between the teams and, uh, excuse me, customer satisfaction and the interaction between the employees and the customer to me seems like one of the, the hallmarks for measurement. Um, but, you know, cultures change around the world too. And, uh, from autonomous autonomous's perspective, do you see this these changes and and what we're we're going through right now as primarily a North American or a U.S. phenomena, or how do you see this in other parts of the world? Um, uh, who's ahead? Who's behind? Um, uh, you know, uh, culturally things are quite different, uh, and business is quite different. What, what's your view on, on the, the global trend versus the U.S. trend? I think the global trend is also um, changing the way that the U.S. trend is right now um, because the pandemic impact globally, not just the U.S. And so everyone now, like we have teams in Canada, in uh, California, in Vietnam, and in every location, everyone work from home. And so... It, the change, the impact is quite similar in different organs, uh, in different teams, in different locations. Um, and so I think that the idea of like saying that like, oh, the U.S. has been ahead because it was, uh, the, it was been hit in like March last year and then some other country a little bit later. So it really depends on how the pandemic impact and how people react to it. Um, the cultural change happens similarly. 
but not every all the countries are in, impacted. And so um, I wouldn't say that one country is, is ahead or another. Like, and also with this time of technology, the lesson learned from one country is being transferred to another country and how they applied what the mistakes or what the lesson learned from the, from, uh, the country have been gone ahead to the new situation. So it's, the catch up is really quick. Um, it's not as um, lacking as uh, before. I think it's also go back into like technology and social media and all the information that's been transferred. Well, you know, um, it's funny. I, 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 I agree that technology knowledge transfers around, but I'll disagree a little bit in that, uh, and I'll give an example. I was chatting with a, a friend who's a, a business colleague uh, down in uh, Australia. Um, and here's a country very much linked to the US, uh, common language, common technologies, uh, et cetera. We all like surfing. Uh, uh, you know, and the, and the ocean, at least here on the West Coast. So uh, we're very um, uh, linked together. And yet each of our governments has reacted in radically different ways. In Melbourne, as an example, there are no cases of COVID and yet they are completely locked down. They can't even go outside of the city or outside of their state to cross into another part of Australia completely locked down, same in Sydney and same in other parts of Australia. So our governments have reacted so much differently that in that marketplace, people are forced absolutely positively, they must work only from home. In our marketplace here, and I know you're in New York and I'm in California, again, different rules uh, between the states, um, but we're in a more of that hybrid model. Mm -hmm. Um, In certain markets, that I see uh, in Europe now, uh, UK is a good example. Um, uh, work is pretty much back to normal, um, uh, however people want to do it. But companies are making the have made the choice. It says people like the hybrid. We mm-hmm. we're having a hard time keeping good employees. We want to offer flexible work as mm-hmm. a model. Yeah. Uh, so different different models working around even though the technology transfers the, the other issue um, is place um, if you're a young person starting business and you happen to live in Paris uh, your your entire apartment is smaller than my office yes. uh, tiny 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 same little in office. New York <laughs> uh, same in New York same in Tokyo same in Hong Kong and places and such so so there are certain marketplaces where it's not suitable to work from home. You don't have a physical workplace. And I'm curious how autonomous as a company and, and the, from the research that you've done into those types of markets, how you see people reacting to the proverbial lockdown or the migration. Are those people working not just from but near home, uh, from home, but also near home? How are, how are you seeing that go? Uh, uh, yeah, um, I think, yeah, like it, it definitely um, depends on the country. As you mentioned, like if the country, like Australia locked down, like people can't go outside. Um, so like for the case uh, in New York, then people go to co-working places and things like that. But for the places in Vietnam, it's completely locked out. Everyone works from home, says so no going out at all. Um, so it really depends on like the the legal situation in its location. Um, but for like working from home after several months become like such a lonely situation. Like, um, and so the idea of providing an uh, option outside, if allowed, if allowed by the law, if allowed by like whatever the um, uh, authority in that specific town or location. Um, that could help the employee so much more with like well-being, seeing other people. At the end of the day, we are social animal, and um, instead of like staying home and work in a small apartment, uh, I think that is really like will be extremely helpful. And um, also, I don't think that the whole thing with remote is completely remote is going to really stick. I think it's. The remote, the hybrid model works more because people at the end they can just meet with a, the the coworkers, 
or um, like they can just be at home on a day that they want to stay at home. So, um, or they can just go to a nearby office. Um, I think that is a much more sustainable model in a way that like help the employees with their um, productivities and well-being um, rather than forcing one way or another. Well, we, I don't we, think it's the extremist yeah, way. I, I think we'd, we'd agree. We've been saying for a number of years that there's no such thing as an office occupier anymore, that everybody is a traveler. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we think in terms of everybody really uh, being a digital nomad. Uh, but there are three different layers of being a digital nomad. There's the layer that says, uh, uh, I have this romantic image of being a digital nomad and I take my surfboard to Bali and I get a gig job and, and I just kind of hang out. Um, and that, th then there's the what we call the digital slow mad, which is someone that maybe has a permanent job, but Maybe they live in Paris for six months and then move down to Barcelona or over to New York, but they have a permanent job. They're really connected. Uh, maybe they're working with a team remotely or, or, or by themselves. And then the great majority of us are what we call digital nomads, mm -hmm. local nomads. We're local nomads. And we might be like, I know you're at a co-working center today and I'll, 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 I'll throw in a pitch here for coalition space. I know you're at coalition space in New York, which is a very fine co-working group. Um, I'm working from my residence later today. I'll be in a meeting in a conference room at my office, which is down the road. Um, tonight I'll be back in my residence, but on technology connected to people in Asia and Australia. So, we're all very local we're staying local but we're moving from place to place and technology to technology mm -hmm. um, as we work on a continuing basis so i think fluidity uh and that nomadism uh if you will on a on a, a local basis is really more of a definition of how hybrid work functions uh, than saying two days at the house, two days at the office, one day at, in the co-working center. You know, it, it, it's all much more fluid uh, uh, these days. And so uh, that's, to me, what, what we see going on. And I'm interested how Autonomous looks at that nature and what you've seen uh, from your client companies. Again, let's stick with Google. Uh, Google used to say, hey, uh, you work from home one day a week, and, and that was it. And the, the employee had whatever laptop or computer they had at home, and they just connected to Google system. And that was, that was the end of the conversation. Oh, you want to work from home on Fridays? That's fine. That was 2017, 18. Yeah. Now, 2020, Google says, um, I think you need to work from home for uh, uh, permanently. And you already indicated that Google has a budget, a stipend that uh, an employee says, I need X, Y, Z in order to do that. Um, Google's not paying them for the office space that they're renting, by the way, because, because Google gets the benefit of their, their square footage, but they are providing uh, uh, furniture fixtures and equipment uh, to make that possible. Have you seen upgrades um, like uh, uh, we used to sit at a kitchen table in a kitchen chair because it was one day a week or a couple of hours a week or something like it. No one thought about it. But are you seeing people go for higher end ergonomics, high low desks, walking desks, um, uh, different larger screen formats? What are you seeing in the changes of what people are using yeah. to populate their office versus what they used in the past? Oh yeah, that's totally. We have seen that so much at Autonomous. Um, we actually have seen significant increase in demand in both electrical uh, adjustable standing desk and um, also the uh, ergonomic chairs. Um, we like our revenue has increased significantly. It's like expand like you can say like exponential. Don't, don't be don't be bragging. No, no, <laughs> I'm just saying the truth that like there's so many people who want to buy and then not just us, there's so many other brand is, uh, you know, brands out there also selling standing desks and chairs that also have like, you know, there's explosion of it because there's a significant demand. 
Um, and so we, that's why we are trying to make it more accessible and how to help, help employers to help the employees to get it. And there's so many benefits of it. And like, not just on research showing that people feel more energized, people more productive when they use a standing desk, but like, for my conversation, talk directly with our clients and like, they will tell me, oh my God, thank you for the standing desk that like uh, my back pain has reduced significantly. Um, and then people started looking for the chairs as not just uh, the kitchen table, the kitchen, um, the chair that you use in the kitchen. Um, it could cause a back pain. Now they work from home, like from morning to evening. There's like a go back to the measure of performance. Now you have to put, deliver. And actually, people have been working longer hours yes. since the pandemic. So I, we, and I, I think that's an important thing that. People, when they work from home, honestly, don't take as many breaks yes. as when they're in the office. Um, they don't take a proper lunch or middle of the day break to get up and get a little exercise, just move around. And and, and they, they do stay, data has shown, they everybody stays glued to their screen because mm -hmm. uh, there's, no, uh, there's less distraction, which is good for concentration, but it's also bad for movement. Yeah. Totally, totally. And like the one thing is what I mentioned is that not every, like uh, it was like the idea of standing desk, it was like, oh, I don't want to stand working all the time. It's not about standing all the time. It's then like here and there, not just mm -hmm. all the time. So that helps with the movement and the help with the, uh, the like wellness situation. Um, and so that's definitely the significant demand that like also I've seen a research showing that like people who come to co-working spaces, 76% of the surveys say that like they want this ergonomic chairs and things that, but they don't have it. Only like, I think they said like 30%, something like that, they said that they have those options. And so not just like, you know, work from home, they have that, that like if they provide a nearby location, they should think about that as well. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's important, you know, um, a, a big, part of what we've learned through this pandemic process is to look at the office environment, whether it's at home or at a business or co-working center or at the central office, to look at that environment and see what things impact health in general, um, uh, both physical health and, and, and mental well-being. Yes. Uh, to, to really look at those two things and try and refine, it's one of the good things that's come out of this, and, and, and try and refine what we can to create a better working environment because we spend a third or a half of our lives in that environment. Exactly. And, and, and so that is something that I think is really uh, your spotlighting uh, overall and something that we've seen as well as, as a positive outcome uh, of, of all of this. Yeah. Well, now, how, how would people reach you or how would people reach Autonomous if they wanted to, to learn more and if they wanted to understand uh, some of the data? You guys have lots of data, lots of research, um, I know, uh, on all of this. Uh, how would they access uh, that through you? Yes, uh, just go to autonomous.ai and um, just going to the platform, you can see um, there is a lab in the bottom. Um, so you can look for all the uh, blocks that we write. Um, and then for in order to connect with me, you can just look up. Uh, so my email is yeah, nhat.win, n-t-u-y-e-n, at autonomous.nyc. Uh, um, and so uh, I'm happy to connect with anyone that who want to learn more and uh, anything that we can do to help the employees during this time. Like we're all hands. I really appreciate that, Nat. And we'll post all of your contact information with this podcast so people can reach out easily should they, they want to and, and get that additional layer of information. And we're really grateful to you for the time you spent with us today. And uh, uh, I think the attention that Autonomous is spending to make the both the home work environment and the near for home work environment uh, improved for both employer and employee for everyone is a huge contribution to the future of work and uh, we thank you for your time yeah thank you so much for talk, uh, for having me frank and it's great talking to you take care take care bye